I'd like to thank the Hennepin County Mental Health Association for helping to make this show possible. Our topic today is the mind-body connection or the psychological effects of physical fitness. The Greeks, I think, had it right. They said to be a whole person, you had to be both of sound mind and sound body. Well, my guest today is a former Olympian. I guess once an Olympian, always, always an, Olympian, an Olympian, right? My guest is Ron Dawes, who was in the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City. He's an author. He has written a book called The Self-Made Olympian and is working on a, another book with right. the working title. The working title is Running Your Best. Running Authors your best. seldom get to choose their own title, so we'll have to see what it comes out as. It's a good title, though, if It's if exactly what hold. the book's about. Mm -hmm. You're also run a lecture, and you've done lectures on running and physical fitness all over the country and some, some abroad, parts of the world, too. Right. Uh -huh. And you are a coach. So looking forward to talking and, and hearing what you have to say about this mind-body connection. Okay. I think the more I read and the longer I live, the more I realize how closely the mind and body are integrated. And um, we really can't separate one from another. No, you can't, because everything that you do physically has to originate in the mind or in the head. Unless you get, give the signal to do it, nothing will happen physically. Mm -hmm. Now, when we mention the Olympics, I think before we get too much uh, further, people are curious, I'm sure, what was it like to be in the Olympics? The, the pitch, the, the fever is rising now in the United States um, for this year's Olympics. And I'm sure it makes you think back and even remember more closely what it was like oh, it does. 16 yeah, it years gets ago. gets the adrenaline going. I think it's an individual experience for everybody. For me, it was particularly good because I was the underdog, the guy who was not supposed to make it. So when you I made it... You weren't the Salazar oh, no, 68. No. You see, when Salazar doesn't make it or Frank Shorter doesn't make it and, and uh, the sprinter Lewis doesn't make it, that's a big surprise. When I made it, that was a big surprise. <laughs> so I think who it meant Ron more... Who is huh? That's what they were saying. Uh -huh. So for me, it meant even more, even though I didn't get a medal. You um, were at uh, Alamosa, California, or Colorado, Colorado. to... Um, get into the Olympics. And that race, from what I've read, it was an interesting, exciting one for you. Well, it was. Actually, I had to pass a trial before I could get to Alamosa, which was a training camp for Olympic hopefuls. And there were 20 people who qualified through different regional trials among the USA. I was 19th on that list. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's more is I was fourth in that trial. And when you get to the real trials, to the trial of everybody, you have to be in the top three. So things did not really look good for me. What do you think, when you look back, made the difference? I mean, why did you get on that top three berth um, and others didn't who were more likely to, to do it? Yeah, I think that's what the others are wondering. I think <laughs> it was because I didn't make as many mistakes as they did. I think I knew exactly how to train. I did my training and I just made fewer mistakes. And I had a lot of opportunities to make mistakes because 10 days before the trial, I got a sciatic nerve condition, which reduced me to a walk, mm. which was very unnerving. As it turned out, it, it saved my life because it forced me to rest. When you're so revved up that you want to make up for every workout that you've ever lost, so you train yourself into a frazzle before the trials. And then, mm. although you're fit, you're exhausted. See, I was fit and rested. I know you have um, written a lot about using your head when you're training. And I wanted to talk some about that, but I also want to talk about some of the benefits to the head from being physically fit. And um, you certainly um, talk a lot about these, I know, in your lectures. One of them that I'd like to have you comment on is the whole area of stress and how running or, and I think we should make this clear, not just running, but other sports really help reduce mental stress? Well, the, run, the lessons that you lose, that you learn in running are applicable to a lot of different things in life. I think most people associate stress as a negative thing, but stress is actually something that you need. And the whole theory of running is that you apply a stress to the body and uh, then you rest. And during that rest period, you adapt and you recover to a slightly higher plane than you were. And then you go back and re-stress again, and that's how you get better. But there's also the reduction, I think, anyway, of, of the another kind of stress, stress. of mm -hmm. a mental and stress. And that's 
that's what I'd like you to comment well, on because also. Well, to me, my running is also my play time. Mm -hmm. And if I, when I'm working a regular eight-hour job, and that's a very mental thing, and it's very exhausting. When I get done with that, I feel absolutely exhausted. And I can't imagine that I'm going out and run, say, 15 miles. Mm -hmm. uh, you just don't feel like doing it. But once you get your clothes on, and you, you runners say that the hardest thing about a workout is turning the doorknob to get out of the door. <laughs> but once you get out the door and you're mm -hmm. on your way, then you get this rejuvenation. You're in, in a whole different world. It's no longer a mental world. It, it's a physical thing. And you're using a whole different energy system. And so when you do this, there's a whole release of all the stress of the day. You're on your own. You're free. You're doing your thing. I do some, some running. And, um, and I, I go out and run and come back. I often feel so much fresher, really, mentally and so much ready to tackle whatever I have to tackle. That's exactly um, it. That's what some people call a runner's high. So in other words, when, let's say, a work day is over and I go out and run, and I'm, sometimes I've had like an upset stomach or whatever, and I think, my gosh, I can't run tonight. I'm, I'll catch the bus and I'll go home. This is when I was running from work. But actually, after I get done with a workout, I feel much better than I did at the beginning. And uh, kids in school know this. Now, what do people do that, that have regular work hours. They have a coffee break mm -hmm. and because they're feeling down they go out and they have some coffee and sugar stuff, some rolls, mm -hmm. which actually raises their blood sugar level. That causes you to secrete insulin which lowers your blood sugar level and you feel worse. What do kids in school do? They go out for recess and they run around and play and they come back in feeling better. After coffee breaks where I eat and drink stuff I come back feeling worse. Well, the, yeah, the, the effects of the sugar really slow a system down or Caffeine has an immediate high, right? Yeah, and but then a, a delayed low, right? Sluggish result. So many grown-ups, so many adults that I talk to, say, "Well, I'd like to exercise. I'd like to swim or bike or run or whatever, but I don't want to take the time away from my family, or I don't have the time." Period. Um, what do you say when people ask you about that? I have very little sympathy because I've been in that boat where I had a family, worked a 40 hour a week job, and I was also running between 110 and 130 miles a week. And what you learn is to be very efficient with your time. And you know, the average American watches six hours of television every day, day, every day. day. Is that it? So when people tell me they don't have the time, I say, well, are you watching the prices right or family feud? If you're watching this sort of thing, then it's a matter of priorities. And you'll do anything that you really want to do. So if you, if you go through a day, let's say for a week, and keep a list of, of how you're spending your time, you're going to find out you're wasting an awful lot of time. And anybody who doesn't have a half an hour of time to spend running, if he wants to, is just fooling himself. You had a quote once. You said that people need to have some struggle in their lives. And you were talking in the sense that struggle gives a person some, some benefits psychologically. Can you explain that? Well, That's a puzzling yeah, it's quote. kind of a complicated thing, but it, wars are a struggle. And when there are no wars, then you have space races to the moon between us and the Russians. If you don't have that sort of thing and you're not in a personal struggle, you go to see the Vikings play or the Twins play, and you watch other people struggle. Mm, okay. And I think people need this sort of struggle with themselves because it gives you a chance to, to, to find out who you are. In normal life, you, you never get a chance to find out if you're a hero or a coward because you're not presented with life and death situations normally. But in running, you can find, or in any sport, or in any, it could be playing the piano, or it could be pursuing anything where you're trying to reach for a, a certain level of excellence. So you set up a goal, and you set it up so that you can have successes. What and if you're not successful, though? What if you're in the back of the pack, or you're, you know, one of the slowest bikers, or whatever? I mean. Can you still? Well, it depends on your definition of success. Now, I came back from the Boston Marathon some years ago where I'd finished fourth. And this fellow at work insisted that because I hadn't won that I had lost. And I said, are you telling me that only one person won and that uh, 2,000 people lost were losers? And he, and he insisted that that was true. And I said, well, gee, for losing for fourth place, and I was the first American in, I just got a trip to go to Korea to represent the US. And if that's losing, well, that's OK with me. But if your goal in winning is, is to finish the marathon and you finish it, then you're a success. If your goal is not to run the four-minute mile, but maybe a five-minute mile or a six-minute mile, and you do that, then you've won. Or a seven-minute mile. Or a seven-minute seven minute mile. Minute I don't mile. care. Or, or even the hobble a thing. Uh -huh. Then uh -huh. you've won. If you've 
done what you set out to do. And then, of course, you keep raising the standard a little bit, and you keep meeting new struggles. And you get a sense of, of that you have a control over your life. I think that's a real key idea here, because I think um, that's one of the real problems in urban America. So many of us don't have a sense that we have much control. Um, and maybe you're saying through, through some sport, you, you gain some of that control back. You gain a control, and you also change your self-image. When people who are heavy and who go on diets and, and almost invariably fail are interviewed, how they feel about that, the biggest comment that they have is that they feel like they're not in control of their life. They can't control what they're eating and what they're doing. And so to get on a program and to, at the beginning, you, know, you have to make yourself do it for the first month until it becomes a habit. You go out and you force yourself to do this thing. You get a certain feedback that you have a control over what you can do. Another area of um, benefit when we're talking about psychological benefits that I've heard you talk about is self-confidence can go up when you tackle something and succeed at it in your, your way. Well, um, yeah, this goes back to me. Now, when I was in junior high and in, in grade school, I probably had a fairly self-low image because when teams were picked, you'd always have the two tough guys in the school and they'd go out and they'd pick the teams. I'd always be the last guy picked for baseball or football or whatever because I couldn't catch the ball and I couldn't hit the ball and I was basically pretty worthless. Now, that so I is never a little hard to believe. No, but I, I never went out for you, okay. But. I never went out for sports. Uh -huh. And when they had field day when I was in junior high, I never went out because I didn't think I was good enough. But and I didn't think of this until years later, I was always active as a kid. I played a lot. I went swimming all the time. I went ice skating, tobogganing, we played tag, we played pom pom pull away. We played very hard. We'd set up fish poles in the backyard and try to jump over them or ropes. And, and we wrestled like we saw the, the guys on the TV, the pro guys. Mm -hmm. So we did all these things. And actually that and not sport was my background for sport later. And so the self-confidence that well, you have now partly came from Partly came involved. from that, but I, mm -hmm. my play was on a very low level. It wasn't like organized sport. Mm -hmm. And then later when I got into running, there's a great thing about running in, in that even minute uh, increments of success are measurable. Mm -hmm. And I always like to think of if I'm out there trying to hit a softball, and let's say I miss by three inches, Okay, now I practice, practice for two weeks, and I come out and I miss by two inches. I've made a one-third improvement. The effect on the game is the same. I still miss the ball. But if I come out and running as a nine-minute miler and I improve to an eight-minute miler, which is equivalent to missing the ball in baseball because it's not a very good mile, yet I can still see that improvement because I can time it. And in, in so many areas of life, we don't see, we can't measure don't get what feedback. we're doing yeah, you don't. Very, very objectively anyway. If you're just trying to be a better person or whatever, how do you measure mm -hmm. that against some standard? You can't. Or write it, a better report. Or write a better or report. Give a better talk. Or, or down at work, you do. Let's say you do a, a real good job, and nobody recognizes mm -hmm. the fact that you did it. Did it. Mm -hmm. So, the, you know, you don't get this feedback. But in running, you can you can get it. Mm -hmm. Or other, other. Or in anything. Exercise. Yeah. yeah. I don't care if it's tennis you can or swim running or what. Ten laps one day and twelve sure. the next. Sure. Or if it's even walking around the lake. Mm -hmm. I want to talk some Ren, about some of the principles that you use in your sport running that are transferable really um, to other areas of life. Okay. Um, you told me once that last summer you were running 100 plus miles a week in the hot, hot summer yes. of last summer. <laughs> to my eventual demise. <laughs> well, that took, that took a lot of discipline and I guess that's one of the, the things I wanted to ask you about. How do you find the discipline, and does the discipline in your running then transfer over into other areas of your life? It does, and it has. Because one of the things you learn how to do is set goals. And they should be fairly realistic goals, but they should also be tough goals, because it's not very challenging to meet easy goals. And then in order to meet those goals, you have to be disciplined. Uh, that's the way my running is. Like on weekends, it's the easiest time not to run because you have all day to do it. So you'll put it off and put it off. But when I go to work, I know that I have to run in the morning before I go to work, and I have to run immediately upon coming home from work, or I don't run, or there's no other time. Mm -hmm. So you learn to set these disciplines. Now on weekends, if I'm going out for a run, I run straight away in the morning. Mm -hmm. Or I know that I'll get involved in something else, and and uh, I'll keep putting it off until I don't do it. And you learn to do that with a lot of things. 
Uh, when I went through high school and college, I was a C and D student in English, mm -hmm. and saw myself as somebody who who, who didn't know anything about English and, and couldn't write. All I knew about uh, writing was that sentences began with big letters and ended in punctuation. Mm -hmm. And now, because I saw that I could come from a mediocre runner, a guy at the back of the pack, and eventually raise myself up to a standard higher than I thought, I now earn a lot of my living as a writer. That, yeah, that is You amazing. see, so I can take the same lessons I learned in running about setting goals and pursuing, being consistent, persevering, uh, having setbacks and, and coming around them, innovating. Mm -hmm. I've had times when I, when I couldn't run, so I used to run at work up and down a, a stairwell in a fire escape, mm -hmm. uh, nine floors up and down on my coffee breaks. Now, a lot of people won't do that. And when I got thrown out of there, I built a treadmill in my basement to get other runs done in the morning when it took me too long to go out in the wintertime. And you'll do the same thing in other areas of life. If you want to do something, you'll find a way to do it. When you mention innovating, that's, I guess that's what you did with the stairwell. That's what you did with the mm -hmm. treadmill thing. Right. Um, as you are getting now into your late 40s, right, mm -hmm. um, do you find that you're innovating in your running to, to do some things differently so that you can still keep competing? I know you're still competing. Um, do you use that principle back and forth that way? Well, most of the innovating I did when I was trying to reach my peak, I was trying to find out how good I could become at one point. And now that I've done that, I don't run with the same intensity that I used to, but now I'm trying to do other things that I wasn't doing then and didn't have time to do, like writing, I'm going to get into artwork and so forth. And, and then I'll innovate to do those things. But the principles are transferable that, yeah, that's what from it, one to the I'm other. Hearing you and say. so mm -hmm. it, now I, I just see myself as if I can do it in one thing, I can do it in anything I want to do. So that confidence, again, is, mm -hmm. is being used in Once different ways. Once you've seen ways. it work, then you know it can work again. Mm -hmm. In one of your books, you write about visualization, mm -hmm. and that's a concept that I think is, is a complex one, but I think it's a fascinating one, and I'd like to have some, um, you know, some input here from you on how you use that both in running and in other parts of your life. Well, again, it's a way of seeing yourself. No. Well, how do you define it, first okay, of all? Okay, visualization is seeing yourself as you would like to be. And it's programming these images of the way you would like to be into your subconscious. Because your subconscious, this is getting into psychology now, mm -hmm. doesn't distinguish between reality and fantasy. And a good example of that is, is, is years ago when I ran track at the University of Minnesota. And you'd hear the call for the one mile run and you'd get all wound up. Okay, well maybe on Saturday morning I'd be watching an indoor track meet on the television. I'd be watching the meet and I'd be spectating and I'd be just sitting back and enjoying it. And then the announcer would say, and next we'll have the one mile run. And immediately my heart would start pounding. I'd start sweating. I'd get the shakes. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, well, you know, what's the problem? You're not running. Those guys are running. And yet I couldn't stop myself from trembling because my subconscious didn't know that I, I wasn't really running. It heard the call for the one mile. Consciously I knew it. Subconsciously I didn't. So I was gearing up mm -hmm. to take off when the gun went off. Okay, that's how the subconscious works. So if you can get into the subconscious, like through relaxation techniques or or hypnosis is another way, and program your head with images of the way you want to perform, mm. then the body will try to create reality from this. So if you look at what most people do, they make excuses, they berate themselves, they feed themselves a lot of negative thoughts about all the things that they can't do. And I talk to people about running, and they say, oh, I'd love to run, but I can't even run for the bus. Well, you mm. keep feeding yourself this sort of thing, and then it becomes reality. I once heard that the head is like a tape recorder, Everything we tell ourselves is recorded, and that's it's, right. you know, it's sitting there, it's kind sitting of there. Conscious, playing back. <laughs> that's right. Consciously, mm -hmm. it may not be av available to you, but the subconscious will never forget any of it. And if you keep telling yourself that you can't do this, you're no good at this, women say, well, you know, I'm not mechanical, I couldn't do this, mm -hmm. and I couldn't do this, or I'm not uh, this, then you, in fact, become as you see yourself. So if I would want to visualize myself um, giving a talk and doing it well, I could take, take this principle and imagine what I'd look like, um, think about the positive right. image I'm creating, and chances are it would be a much more positive talk than Right. Imagine yourself right? as being confident, saying the things that you wanted to say, saying them with impact, 
uh, envisioning people enjoying or laughing at what you were seeing or having a good time with it. And as you do that, then you, in fact, will do a better job. I, I find that principle, you know, fascinating, and there isn't a lot written on it, so... There's um, more written now, and the whole psychological part of running is, is very important in the Eastern Bloc countries, like in Russia and East Germany and this sort of thing. It's just beginning to be used in this country. Are there any other principles that, that you have found, Ron, that, that you've um, used in running that have transferred over into real life? Oh, sure, a lot of them. One of them, and a very important one, is, is the concept of relaxing and rest. Mm -hmm. Now, everybody knows that when you go out and you have a hard day of running, you better have a next, the next day better be an easy day, or you're going to simply tear, tear down and you'll never come back and you'll enter a chronic state of exhaustion. Uh, that's why I think people should learn how to play. Mm -hmm. And my playtime is m some of my most valuable time. Uh, the Midwestern work ethic, I think, is so prevalent. I know. It's been the, the demise Midwest of... here, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's been the demise of runners, of business people. Mm -hmm. I heard about an insurance salesman, you know, working on commission. And he'd be sitting Sunday morning reading the Sunday paper, and instead of enjoying sitting having breakfast and, and reading the Sunday paper, he would be thinking about all the accounts mm -hmm. that he should be contacting, all the people he should be contacting instead of sitting there enjoying it because these were people he couldn't see on Mondays and Tuesdays. And he finally got to the point where he had a nervous breakdown because every moment that he was enjoying himself and not working, he was losing money. Mm -hmm. That's the way he saw it. Mm -hmm. And eventually he came apart. We're almost out of time, but I want to just ask you a little bit more about the book you're writing and about some of the lectures you're doing. Um, the book you said is called Running Your Best. Mm -hmm. Um, does it take off where your first book ended, or, or how do you describe it? Well, it's a much more detailed book than the first book, and basically it's geared, it sounds like an elitist book for the guy who wants to set the world record, but it's not. It's for anybody who wants to improve, because that's okay. the one thing that everybody can do. Now, I can't set a world record, and you can't, and almost everybody we know cannot do that, but you, everybody can improve and can become better than he thought he possibly could, and this book tells how to do it. When will it be out, or, or do you know yet? It should be out early next year. Okay, it's been we'll two and a half forward. years in the writing, so I'm anxious to see it. <laughs> to be born, huh? Yes. <laughs> now, lecturing, you're doing lectures um, in the metro area, mm -hmm. outstate, I know. Mm -hmm. um, what kinds of topics, and um, where could people contact you if they're interested in having some input, some lecturing on physical fitness or running? Well, the topics that I cover are almost anything that is running related. It could be training methods, it could be supplementary training, it could be this whole visualization thing that we just talked about. Uh, it could be a whole lot of other, there's so many subjects that you can go into. People think running is very simple and then it's just alternating legs and then, you, you know, they say, well, how can you write a whole another. book about running? <laughs> But, but there's a whole lot of different aspects. There's all the aspects of competition and how do you race and tactics and, and all the motivational aspects of running. So there's all of that. But how I can be contacted it would be probably to call my home number. And, and um, what is that? We'll which put is that seven, on the screen here. Which is 721-3026. 721-3026. Well, I want to thank you for joining me. It's been enjoyable and I wish we had more time to get into more of so the specifics here. Thank you for joining us. I've been talking with Ron Dawes who as I said earlier was a 1968 Olympian. Um, the mind-body connection we could go on and on but we'll, we'll have to stop here and put our minds to rest. Huh? Okay. And bodies. That's the rest phase. <laughs> Going into rest phase. Uh, thank you. I'll be back next week with another topic that touches us either socially or personally. Until then, have a good week. Yeah.